you know, that, and then why do we let it? Geldof's vision gave USA for Africa a boost, and assistance and devotion made Live Aid a reality. How did you get involved with Live Aid? Um, through Bob Geldof. Bob Geldof called me. Geldof, right? Yeah. Bob Geldof called me up, asked if I wanted to do it, so of course I said, yeah, I'd do it. Live Aid had the whole world watching, and it lived up to the price of a utopian global village. I think Pete Tent forgot that what I actually did was play in a band. And when I was out there just now, it was suddenly some people were made aware of and I suddenly became aware of himself. So I might have just been focusing on getting there to this day, working it out and making sure it worked. And then suddenly I forgot it all for those minutes I was on stage. And it all seemed very real to me and it suddenly struck me, you know, just how exciting it must seem to other people. And it suddenly struck me and I just said... I just realized today is the best day in my life. Following Live Aid, Bob was honored in the U.S. Congress, at the MTV Video Awards, on the floor of the U.N., and in papers for a Nobel Peace Prize nomination. After a year of charitable work, St. Bob says he just wants to go back to being a pop star. But can he, when he knows what it's going to take to feed the world? Geldof used to say, he said it for years, music can't change the world. You know, music really can't change anything. But it look, look, it's changed him so much, and, and through him it's changed the world already. It's changed, the, uh, it's made a world of difference to a lot of people's lives. By now, you've probably heard all the statistics, but here they are one more time. On July 13th, 66 bands performed in front of a total audience of a billion and a half people and raised $80 million to help fight the Ethiopian famine. But numbers aren't everything. The real story of Live Aid might be that if one person pushes hard enough, he can help change the world. Bob phoned me up in January and said, would you do it? And I said, boy, if you can get it together, of course. Not thinking that he actually would. And um, that, for me, is the main achievement of the day, just actually getting this together. Getting the artists together was a massive undertaking. But getting the concert televised live around the world was nothing short of a technological miracle. Thousands of technicians work behind the scenes in the Philadelphia Broadcast Center to keep the concerts on the air in 150 countries, while over a thousand journalists, photographers, and camera crews from around the world recorded the event that would become instant history. In the middle of things, there seemed to be this weird awareness. I mean, uh, I think uh, Mick Brown in the Sunday Times for the best of you, one of the eerie feeling of cities that opposite ends of the earth waving at each other. And I think that was true, like, I mean, it sounds terrible corny, you know, but it really was, in a tangible and fizzle way, the word, the globe was linked. It was a very, very peculiar atmosphere, and I haven't seen, I haven't experienced it before in my life, and I, I'm not sure we will again, but I would like to. Live Aid was a who's who of all the best 1985 had to offer. But the concerts also reunited bands from the past, like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and The Who, who hadn't played together since 1982. Mr. Goldoff made, made us an offer we couldn't refuse. <laughs> I mean, uh, you can't refuse a thing like that. Even with all that differences, it was worth doing that. This is what rock had been promising for 20 years. Power for the people. And strange though, in the end, the bitter irony of it all is, is that, you know, the power turns out to be uh, rock as the people's elected representatives. During Live Aid, Phil Collins almost made time stand still. He played a set with Sting in London, then flew the Concorde to Philly for the Led Zeppelin reunion. So when I got here, I quickly rushed in to say hello to Eric, find out what songs he was playing, rushed over to Jimmy and Robert to see what songs they were playing and I got a quick one, two, three, four through it and I was told to lay off if I didn't know where I was, which I, which I laid off quite a lot. Um, no, no rehearsal at all. Well, it ain't time to think about it, really. We just said we'd do it. This is the right reason to do what we did. Live Aid focused the eyes of the world on the rock and roll community, proving for both the artists and the audience that music can be more than just entertainment. Suddenly, uh, people want more out of rock and roll. If we can't take time out to do this for this cause, then who can? I know for myself and for our band, it's the only altruistic thing we've ever done in our existence. I know that Bob's been saying that there's, that, that there's no way this will happen again, but I really hope that some, something else could happen, some more things could happen. The Seed for Rock's next major benefit concert was planted right on stage. I just like to say I hope that some of the money that's raised 
call them people in Africa. Maybe they could just take a little bit of it, maybe one or two million, maybe, and use it, say, to pay the uh, pay the mortgages on some of the farms and um, that the farmers here owe to the banks. sort of guilted everybody into, uh, you know, gee, what have we been doing for 10 or 12 years? Nothing. And suddenly you realize that it wasn't that much of an effort to just volunteer some time as long as the cause is worthy. You got the high, high. You got the jump and John Fogarty and 53 other artists found a worthy cause on September 22nd, attracting 80,000 fans and over 20 million TV viewers to Champaign, Illinois. Farm Aid was organized by Willie Nelson with help from Neil Young and John Cougar Mellencamp to call attention to the plight of America's embattled family farmers. The family system in this country is threatened at its very core by what's happening. If the family farm dies, the small family business in rural towns dies, and it could possibly turn them into ghost towns. There's a song for all you mamas out there, keeping those families together, and all you farmers' wives. Doing your best. Unlike Live Aid, Farm Aid focused on issues close to home. And with rock and country stars getting together on a grand scale, the concert was a spirited celebration of American music. This is Take a walk in the wild side. It's really neat to see all those different kinds of uh, talent together and all that different kind of audience together, you know, see them rubbing, rubbing elbows out there maybe for, for the first time. I was standing by Willie on the stage and uh, Merle Haggard walked off and Bon Jovi walked on and they loved Merle and they loved Bon Jovi, so, you know, to me that was great. Farm Aid contained its share of superstar duets. Bob Dylan was backed by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Neil Young got back to the country with Waylon Jennings. And Daryl Hall left the big bamboo behind to play with Billy Joel and Bonnie Raitt. Every time you go Farmers' problems continue, but Farm Aid managed to raise $11 million and some awareness about a crisis in our own backyard. We haven't been always able to do this, but thanks to television, uh, thanks to things like We Are the World and Live Aid, now, uh, for some reason, people are listening to what the musicians have to say. The power of music blew the cover off apartheid in South Africa this year. Sun City took music one step beyond charity into politics and protest, as Steve Van Zandt brought together 53 artists to speak out against racism. Sun City represents one of the fundamental aspects of apartheid, that relocation policy. Every time somebody plays Sun City, they're justifying that policy. Calling for a world of racial harmony, Van Zandt created a world of musical harmony. Sun City's participants came from rock, salsa, rap, jazz, and soul across the spectrum of popular music. The sheer scope of Sun City and its potent political message confused and frightened radio programmers, and the record was slow to receive airplay. But despite that resistance, artists united against apartheid have sold over 300,000 albums, and they've spoken in both the U.S. Congress and the United Nations. As 1985 drew to a close, artists were getting involved in another battle, this one against AIDS. In December, Cindy Lauper hosted what appears to be the first of many Rock Against AIDS benefits. And Dionne Warwick and Elton John released That's What Friends Are For, a record whose proceeds are going to AIDS research. That's what friends are for. thing that kind of sticks in my mind as bad is this whole thing about, you know, putting stickers on records, which uh, I think is just ridiculous. They might as well sticker every book. 